Sound good? All right. The worst thing about last night was actually that they made you throw out your drinks before you could go into the locker room for an hour. It was horrible. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Will. I'm going to talk about indicators of compromise, because that's our favorite thing. But first, our favorite slide. There we go. To keep the legal team happy, I have to tell you that my employer, Salesforce, is a publicly traded company, and you shouldn't make any buying or selling decisions based on what I say here today. But now that that's out of the way, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So this was me, this was my team, and what was happening to us is we were just collecting these indicators. We had a huge database, amazing indicators, and we were doing nothing with them. I mean, how many of you felt like this chipmunk? Oh, I'm so, oh. Yeah, so you're collecting the indicators. You think they're great indicators, but you don't do anything with them. So what we did was we wrote Overlord, and we call it Overlord because it is all-encompassing. All right. It, all-encompassing, so it's going to cover all of our environments and it's going to do automated indicator searching. What I mean by automated indicator searching is not, it's not in response to an incident. So when you find an incident, you're not actually going out and looking for the indicators. It's in the background 24-7, always looking for indicators. And it does also this nifty thing, historical look back. So when we get a new report coming in from a trusted third party that says, hey, these indicators are bad, this is APT1, this is APT2, we need to go do the searches. All of this is automated with Overlord. It's going to do, all we do is we put them into the database and we'll do the historical look back. Multiple environments. Salesforce is a really big company. We buy a lot of companies. And what happens there is you get a lot of separate environments. And so Overlord is going to work in all those separate environments. Works nicely. And of course, last but not least, it actually works. So we've actually caught our red team using Overlord. It's kind of amazing that it actually caught the red team. But uh, they made a couple mistakes, and we caught them using Overlord. We wouldn't have seen them otherwise. So who am I? Well, obviously, I'm not a basketball player, right? Too short? Um, I'm a security researcher, hopefully a couple South Park fans out here. Um, I focus in automation, so trying to automate myself out of a job. I do incident response when I need to, so whenever the C-cert needs to escalate something to me, uh, I'll help out. And then, of course, all the hunting and thready threats, et cetera, all the fun stuff, right? So let's start with a brief roadmap, what I'm going to cover. I'm going to go over the problem and then talk about the goals, the way we saw the goals. So, as Ishmael was talking about, this is a very specific solution to our problem. So our goals may be different than what everybody else was, but these were our goals. Then I'm going to do a deep dive into Overlord, talk about how it was built uh, and all of the methodology that went into the different components of it. And then we're going to do a demo. And because of how awesome SANS is, it's all recorded. So it will work, theoretically. Cool. So problem statement. We're like cats. We like to get stuck, right? It's the indicator firehose. Number one list, number one on the list of problems is always the indicator firehose. Everybody's got indicators to give us. Everyone claims they're good, and it's just, it's a, it's a firehose. There's nothing that, you, you can't describe it by anything else. It's a firehose of, you know, some people might call it fecal matter, but it's a firehose nonetheless. And then, once you get that firehose, you have to deal with the complexities of volume. You have to deal with how to store it, how you, you can't take all those indicators you get, and you can't throw them at Splunk. You can't throw them at Sumo Logic. It's going to crash the whole system, right? Then you've got to have backups of all this. You have to have a case management system that can handle all of these alerts. It's, it's, it's a mess. And what happens is you end up feeling like that guy. I don't know if you guys can see. There's a poor little guy right there. He's surfing his wave of indicators, and he, he's going to have a bad time. Up next on our list of problems is consistency across sources. So the fun part about this is how many of you have blocked Google? Right? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> the indicators are coming in. You know it's a good source. You're excited about them. You really want to do something with them, and then all of a sudden you block Google. I'm like, come on. How, how did that happen? I mean, it, that, that has happened to us. Um, and then in addition to that, you've got to deal with all the source types. So you, you have all these atomic indicators, right? You've got IPs, you've got hashes, you've got certs, and then you've got behavioral indicators coming in as well. You know, a little bit of, you know, say they should be hitting this IP with this cert for it to be bad, otherwise it's good. It's just a complete mess. Oh, rip. And then competing priorities. So one of the problems with being on the threat intel team is that whenever there's an incident, it gets escalated to you. And you have to help out when there's an actual fire. And you can't just sit there going through all the feeds and analyzing all the feeds and trying to figure out what's good, what's bad. That's not a good use of your time. You actually have to go and fight the fires. So goals. Got to remove the human. Humans are expensive. Humans are wrong. You got to remove the human. Automate as much as you can. 
You got to be able to support multiple search environments. As I said before, Salesforce is a really huge, uh, it's just a mess, right? We got tons of acquisitions, prod separate, IT separate. Everybody wants to be a special snowflake, so you got to be able to search in the multiple environments. And then we have to be able to integrate with our case management system. Because if you can't integrate with the case management system and you have to build up a new system, it's not really worth the effort put into building a system. All right. Here we go. This is where the fun begins. So let's say, just as an example, you have a bunch of log, log repositories. Now, we can treat these as special snowflakes. So call one of them your production environment, one of them your IT, one of them an acquisition, and some, one of them can just be something that lives in the cloud. What you want to do is you want to take the indicators that are living in any number of indicator repositories. So the, we, know, we talked about a lot of feeds today that you can get. These could be indicator feeds. These could be internal repos of highly vetted uh, intel that you saw from you know, Red Team or an APT that was attacking you. These are, your these are your feeds, these are your repositories, and what you want to do is you want to take those indicators and you want to say, where do I see those in my network? Where do I see those in my hosts? So uh, I'm going to say a bad word here, which is in the ideal environment, these should all be one, right? But we don't live in an ideal world. We live in a world where everything is separate, nothing works as it should work. So real world, we got to design a searcher for each one of these things. So what I mean by a searcher is I mean something that's designed specifically to search in that area. So a lot of these areas, they have particular network rules or there are particular vendor product that only talks on a certain port or only talks through a certain API. So to make this really simple and really easy to implement, we wrote one particular searcher for each one of these products. What this means is, <laughs> let's say that searcher one is our production environment. Searcher one is designed to only search in the production environment, which makes it really slim, very nimble, and it's really easy just to write another one search that searches in uh, area B, right? So area B could be IT. You change the components that you need to change, but you don't have to rewrite the entire searcher. All right. Next up on this is what we're going to call extractors. You can think of these as really fancy parsers. All they're going to do is they're going to take the information from the repository, indicator repository, they're going to parse it into the format that's needed for each one of the searchers, and they're going to send it off to the searcher. There we go. Mess of spider webs. And as you can all guess, what's going to happen next? We're going to have an alerter. All right? We use big words that describe what's going on. All right. Searchers go to the alerter. When, if a searcher finds something, it's going to send the results off to the alerter. And what's really cool about the alerter is that it's completely platform agnostic. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But that searcher then, I mean, the alerter is going to take the results. There we go. And it's going to send them to the instant response system. So if there's any results, they're going to get sent to the instant response system. And the reason that the alerter is separate is because uh, the alerter can do a lot of additional logic on top of those search that are, searches that are coming in. And also, it has to format it and validate the results in a manner that will work with the individual uh, case management system. So this is going to be the driving diagram. I see a lot of you taking pictures. This is the driving diagram of the talk today. So memorize it. <laughs> yes, th there will be a quiz. <laughs> OK. Um, this is something that's really cool that we implement in Overlord. So we have to be able to scale really quickly, and we have to be able to work with a lot of different users. So we built it to work out of a configuration file. This configuration file is theoretically infinitely scalable. It's encrypted at rest because we have a red team that loves to troll us. They would love nothing more than to get into one of our tools and just screw around with the log pipeline. So encrypted at rest lives in memory. Um, and it's really easy to change these settings. So if we wanted to add another searcher, if we wanted to change the way the extractor searched, if we wanted to point to a different API endpoint, all of this is really easy to change through the configuration file. And I'm going to demonstrate that in the demo. And then it's got this nifty object-oriented hierarchy. So it allows us to create sub-searchers or a sub-extractor so that we can create a complex tree that will result in really quick results. Um, so a good example is going to be shown in the demo is that you have a searcher. The searcher is not just going to search the entire Splunk index. It's going to dive down and search on a particular search, uh, source type or a particular uh, index, which will result in alerts coming back right away. Um, modularity. So of course, this is the theme here, is that we've got security everywhere, and we've got a bunch of different environments. So it's got to be able to live in disparate home environments, whether that's on the public internet, whether that's going to be inside IT, inside production. It could have to cr cross boundaries. And we need it to be encrypted when it crosses. So in this case, we use SSL v3. 
And uh, that's just because one of the APIs we were using at the time of implementation uh, could only support SSL v3. So we're going to hit the lowest common denominator there. Um, and transmission validation. So what happens is each one of these modules has the capability of validating the data that's coming in. Um, so we're using an individual cert. So the alerter uses a cert, the, search, the searcher uses a cert, and the extractor uses its own certs so that you can transport between the different boundaries without fear of you know, red team screwing with it. Um, and then does the transmission validation make sure nothing got uh, screwed within transit. All right, the extractor. Much like you know a cat in the bed, it's pretty easy just to extract the indicators from the repository. You're going to retrieve the indicators. You're going to format the indicators. You're going to send them off to the searcher. Um, and what the extractor also does is it's going to control the historical look back. So because it's reaching into the repository and pulling out the indicators, it's going to say, these are the new indicators that you need to do the his historical searches for. Searcher. So the searcher is essentially just the advent of the special snowflake. We have so many special snowflakes, it was such a headache. Anyway, it's customized for every special snowflake, but this does have its advantages. So it allows us to distribute the load. When you have a lot of different environments, you just spin up a bunch of different searches. You don't have to worry about one searcher handling all of the searches for every environment. So a lot of searches distributes the load, makes us happy. And the addition of new environments. This is something that's really important to us because we buy a new company every couple months. It's really easy with searchers that function in this manner just to spin up a new searcher. You literally copy pasta the code, you change the endpoint, and then you can point it there. Or if they're using a different API or whatever they're doing, you change it without having to take down the system. So the rest of Overlord keeps functioning. You don't have to change anything, and you throw in the new searcher, and it, it keeps working without any interruption of service. Um, the alerter. So this is a really nifty piece of code because it is completely platform agnostic. And I mean, obviously, it's going to be generating the alerts, but completely independent. So we also use this. We have bash scripts that are just sending data to the alerter, and that's being set off into the case management system. So it's a component of Overlord, but it's, it can function for any part of your incident response process, for any kind of hunting that you're doing in an environment. We've got to do a lot of automated searching. Sending it all to the alerter is a really good way of getting that alerted on. And platform agnostic on the back end as well. So those alerts that were being sent off, in our case, we're Salesforce, we use the Salesforce platform. But it's a simple JSON. You can send that to any platform that you want to use. Literally, you're, you're changing maybe 10 lines of code. That's it. All right, let's do the demo. Ready? All right. So here's the demo. Uh, what we're going to see here is I'm going to get an indicator. Let's say I get an indicator from one of my friends. And I'm going to open up this file. We're going to, this is going to be, pretend to be the uh, repository file. So instead of actually talking to a repository, we just wrote a text file here. And we can see the big box here. That's what we care about. That's the indicator. That's the type. It's the status. And it's the date. The rest of the stuff is just metadata about who created it, when they created it, and why. And that's all going to get transferred through, but we don't need it for the demo. So what you see me doing here is I'm going in and I'm adding in my IP. So for the demo, I did some malicious activity between these two indicators. Um, so I've added my new indicator to the repository. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the alerter. So the alerter is going to take in four arguments. It's going to take in username, password, the environment, which is going to be dev for the demo, and then the private key to encrypt and decrypt the configuration file. So we're going to give this a run. And everything runs beautifully because it's a demo. Next up, so we've already added the file to the repository. We've already got the alerter running and waiting for feedback. What we need to do is we need to get into the configuration file and make sure the configuration file for, the alert, uh, for Overlord is ready to uh, run. So to do that, we just put in edit config, and we pop. Now, this is a, the demo version, so a lot of stuff's been redacted, so you guys can't log into our system. Um, nah, nobody would do that, right? So up at the top, we see this is the first, uh, first object here. This is going to be the extractor. So the extractor can be treated as the parent. You're going to see search size right there, search size of 15. Consider that the global search size for everything under it. Now you can override that. As you see down the searcher, you're changing the search size down in the searcher right here to 20. So if you didn't change it to 20, it would treat it and it would try and treat it as uh, 50 for the, the remainder of the run. Um, you know, these are, uh, so right here we're seeing all the Splunk usernames, we're seeing more passwords, ignore all of that. The interesting stuff is down here at the bottom. 
So that's controlling the searcher. The searcher is multi-threaded to support you know, really big environments, and that's where you control how long you want to wait until you check the queue, how many threads you want to run, and um, what's the time interval. So when you work in a very small environment, it's really easy. Right now for the demo, everything's set to zero in the smallest, smallest possible number because it's really quick. But if you had a Splunk index that was running really, really slowly, right, didn't have enough hardware, you'd want to increase that. You want to increase the number of threads and you want to increase the time it takes for each thread to finish. So you're not continuously checking because that's how you're going to crash hardware if it's just continuously checking and it's not paying attention to what's actually coming out. Um, so that's that and then we're going to scroll down and we're going to look at, so now we get to see how we're creating one of these sub searchers right here. So this is where the actual search is going on. We're throwing in the strings that we want to have searched in Splunk. So up there right at the top you can see what the output is. Everybody's familiar with how to use Splunk. So we're just putting it into a table and we're going to take yeah, a Splunk, right? It's not Splunks, it's a Facebook, it's a Splunk. Um, so we're just going to throw it into a table and those are the source types that we're looking for in relation to this particular IP. So down at the bottom we can see these are what the source types we're looking for and we know that they have those fields. So again, this is going back, you know, we use a dirty word, should. In a perfect environment, everything would be, every, every source type would have the same type of fields, but it doesn't. So you got to have sub-searchers to make it really, really fast. So you say, when I'm searching for this particular source type, I know I have these fields, and then it's really easy to do. It doesn't, it doesn't increase any, uh, doesn't increase at runtime to do this. Um, what's also interesting here are these five fields. So this is how long you want to do the search back. Um, Overlord doesn't run in real time just because this is a really quick and dirty way to get it done. We do a one hour search back in this configuration file. So that means the time end is zero and the time start is one. And then the other two fields were how far you want to do the, your historical search back, whether you want to go back 10 hours, whether you want to go back a couple days, or go back at, uh, all time. So here we go. This is what the second sub searcher looks like. And so for the example you see here, what we're changing is the index. So we're going to be, the previous one is searching over all of the data in Splunk, and it's searching for a particular subset of the search, search source types. Um, but in this one, what we're searching for is we want to say, I want this particular source type of this uh, index. And it's going, of course, into a different table because it's got different fields. So down at the bottom, you can see how it has a different uh, source type. Oh, we save the file, and we go off and run it. Now, it's going to spit out a lot of data, but I'll freeze it and zoom in so everybody can see what's going on. So we got tail up, and we're just, this is the first thing that comes spitting out. It says that it has managed to encrypt the new file, and it's found a valid extractor and a valid searcher. So what it does is it, it first it encrypts the config, and then it's going to unencrypt it to actually read it. But it goes in there, it's found the searcher, and it found the extractor, which means that there was nothing wrong with how we wrote the configuration file. Next up, this is the extractor. It's going through. It's connecting out to the repository, in this case, the text file. And it's pulling out all of those indicators, and it's parsing them, and it's sending, off, sending them off to the searcher. So it says, you know, it extracted two indicators, it made one search, and then now it's going to be sending them off to the searcher. Up next, so the searcher is going to receive the files, and it's going to run the searches. And this is the straight output from Splunk, which is I found 10, indi uh, 10 results. Um, and then the other, so it ran two searches, one for that first IP, the 29, and the other for the 28. So it found zero for 28 and 10 for, or no, the second one was for the different index. So this is very interesting. So we put in two indicators, and we're coming back here. These are two separate alerts. So the first one, this first field right here, this is just the results file. So Splunk's going to say, hey, we found it. All of these fields, this is what the table looks like. Base64 encoded, that's just going to be sent up as a CSV. Um, but what's interesting is that it split out the two indicators. It ran one search, but it's going to split out the two indicators. Top one we see is the 29, and the bottom we see is the 28. So it's separating, it's pulling apart the file that was returned by Splunk, and it's parsing it into two separate results, which is just being sent. So this is a big JSON blob. And down here at the bottom on both of them, you see these are all the fields that came out of the repository. So this is the who made it, the what, when they made it, the why they made it, and all of it, beautiful JSON, sent straight off to the alerter. So this is the alerter. It's got the valid connection and all the data is coming in. So first thing that the alerter does is it's going to actually look at the message, 
It's going to make sure the length, everything matches up with what it's expecting to receive from uh, the searcher. And then down the very, very last line is it verified it using the signature that's on file. So every user has their own public private key, and the uh, alerter keeps track of that. So now what we see happening is this is the alerter interacting with the platform, it takes the JSON, and it's adding it, it's creating the object and putting it into the queue. Over here, we see success. The alert was created with ID that. Uh, we can take that ID and we can just throw it into the browser on the instance where you're using it, or we can pretend that we're the incident response team and just open up the queue, um, open up the queue, refresh it, and you know, they're already there. So just this, this is what the alert looks like uh, if you were CSERT on the receiving end of one of these. So down here at the bottom, you see uh, the account name. In this case, it was all local. It was IT environment. Subject is which indicator and where you found it. And then the description, that's all the data that was carried over from the repository so that any handler can actually have some context about why they're actually seeing this alert and why they should care. Cool. I'm going to back to the slides. All right, future development. So as I kind of alluded to, Overlord was really developed under war, wartime circumstances. We wanted something that would work. We wanted something that would work now, and we wanted it to fit our environment. One of the biggest problems is that it's searcher speed limited. So if you're working with a, you know, we've been using Splunk a lot. Let's say we're using Sumo Logic instead. If we're working with a Sumo Logic instance that is really, really struggling, then that slows everything else down. So your search is going to run a lot slower, which is going to make Overlord run a lot slower. And there's, you can't control that. That's nothing that can be done in the code. You've got to work with your team that's supporting uh, the log pipeline. And right now in its current version, it's not real time, because that's not what we needed. We wanted a quick and dirty solution that would just get us some level of automatic searching. But it's really easy to make this done. We can write a Kafka module in maybe two hours and plug that in, and it would work with all the existing infrastructure. Um, and then, of course, a tongue twister. Extractor abstraction, which is, there were two of them, right? So there was a separate one for every single indicator repository, and that's unnecessary. Um, in the ideal world, we should be able to abstract it down just to one, and that's something that's on the list to do. And more modules. So I'm currently battling our legal team, and if you ever want to you know, see the color drain from a lawyer's face, tell them you want to open source one of your key security tools. They just, they don't like that. But I'm working with them. This will be coming out soon, hopefully. Um, and with it, I want to put out a threat exchange module as the extractor. So you can plug it directly as soon as it comes out. You download it, and you can plug it in with threat exchange, your search infrastructure, and your loading infrastructure. All right, finally, time for drinks. All right. As, as it is built today and as it was intended, it's very modular. So all those components, the extractor, the searcher, and the alerter, completely, you know, take one out, replace it with whatever you want, hit any endpoints you want, search anywhere you want. Great. Scalable. So with the configuration file and the object-oriented method in which you can use the searchers, there's no reason that you can't scale this to whatever environment you have. And it actually works. Um, so we can do automated searching and it's platform agnostic. We can use this across any number of instances, any alerting platform, any searching infrastructure, or any repository. And of course, what PowerPoint isn't complete without some fancy PowerPoint. Takeaway, it's not perfect, work in progress, but it's gonna get there. All right. Any questions? So it can. Um, but are you you're also talking about the validation of it, making sure it's a good? So that's a really good question. The question was, does the extractor actually do any kind of validation of the indicators? So you know, you're getting in a feed, and you know, we all know what's going to happen. It's going to say Google.com should be blocked. In this circumstance, um, the indicators that are coming in are all highly vetted, and we know that they're good, so we just want to do the searching on them. It doesn't do any kind of validation, but it does have a very use, uh, interesting use case. What the Threat Intel team uh, uses it for is 
we take every new indicator and we just let it run in the background for a couple weeks. And then we look at all the alerts that were generated and we use that to provide a score and rate indicators uh, based on how many alerts we saw coming out of Overlord. But that's really hardware intensive. Yes? Yes. Yes, we do. Oh, mm. I don't know if they'd be interested in that, though. <laughs> so um, the uh, Computer Security Incident Response Team at Salesforce actually um, put out, so we all use the platform. Every team at Salesforce uses the platform to run our teams and keep track of cases and incidents and all that. Um, but the CSERT actually put out, it's free on the App Exchange if you're a Salesforce customer. You can download it and use the same app that they do for incident management. So it comes pre-populated with all the case types, uh, escalation, templates, queues, everything you want, uh, and it makes it really easy. I mean, we love using it to manage all of our instances because you just, you know, you point the overlord there and you say, hey, send them the alerts. Yeah, so, oh, and chatter too. So it's a really great tool for when you're dealing with really large scale incidents, it's really easy to interact with all of the handlers, all of the managers in one, in one place, but. Yes. It's only limited by the infrastructure. So if you have a really robust uh, searching infrastructure, you can search any number of indicators that you want. Yep. No, we age them out. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so time is a big factor, and also we do use the alerts that are coming in. So if we're seeing an alert that's coming in, every time a false positive alert comes in, that's going to make it age out faster. And if we're seeing a lot of good alerts come in, it's going to stay active for a longer time. And the key component of that is actually overlord. All right, no more questions? So that's all done in our repository. So um, we don't, that's not covered in Overlord. Right now it's just a very naive system, but it, there's no reason that you can't have that alerter send that data back to the repository. And if you have a repository that's capable of receiving the information about the alert, there's no reason that it can't mark the alert and then cause the age out to happen faster within the repository. Yes, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh no. Yes, it does. It does. No. I'm not doing that. You can buy me drinks tonight. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much.